Dear friends in Christ, the God-man, true God from all eternity, who, who came into time and took on human flesh and blood and did it with one purpose in mind, to save us sinners from our sin. He also is truly human. And a long day's journey on foot left him tired and hungry and thirsty. We have a Savior who can relate with our physical needs. And he doesn't, he doesn't try to hide that. He's not ashamed of that. In fact, today we see him use it. He uses it to meet somebody, and he uses it to show that he cares about her. He understands and can relate with our physical needs, but he also knows that there's something else that matters most. Jesus' weariness and kindness brought him to a well in Samaria. Most Jews considered Samaria to be enemy territory, but not Jesus. Now, he's well aware of the cultural rift between the Jews and the Samaritans. He just doesn't let it be a barrier for him. Because he came, in, he came to this earth to save all its people from all its nations. And he sits down to take a break at a well. He doesn't have anything to use to drop down into the well to pull out water. But that's okay. Because as the all-knowing Son of God, he knows that he's about to have some company. A Samaritan woman should be arriving right about now. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Seems like a simple enough thing to ask, a simple enough thing to say. I've, I've even said it myself before. But is, it, is that request anything simple? When it comes from the one through whom all things are made, every river and every stream, the one who watched the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, who separated water from water, who put together the two hydrogens and the oxygen and then pushed it aside so dry ground could appear. The one who witnessed water come down for 40 days and 40 nights and physically change this world forever. The one who parted water on multiple occasions just so his people could easily cross safely on dry ground. This is the one who attaches the most wonderful of promises with nothing more than simple water. The promise of eternal life, a promise that is for you and your children. That your sins are washed away. This is the one who walks on water, the one who soon enough will have some of this water flowing out from his spear-pierced flesh. And he says, will you give me a drink? H2O on the rocks. So oh, you don't have any rocks? That's okay. I'll just have a water. He humbles himself to beg this woman for some water. And she replies, you are a Jew. I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Not only is the fact that you have a Jew gladly and willingly talking with a Samaritan something that didn't happen, but also a man talking to a woman is something that didn't happen, at least not without her husband with them. So because of this, as she approaches that well and she sees this Jewish man, recognizably Jewish, sitting at the well, her every expectation is that he is going to completely ignore her absolutely disregard her very existence. Because that's what was normal. That's what they usually did. Oh, the foolish and arrogant ways people are so often comfortable treating each other. But not Jesus. No matter who you are, no matter who you're with, no matter what they've done, there is no reason for you to ever have arrogance. And there is never an excuse for you to treat them like you're better than they are. If anyone has the right to do that, it's Jesus, and he never does it. Christianity is humility. Recognizing our total depravity and our total dependence. And so in, then in that dependence, we look back on our lives. We see our dependence on, on God in humility and that's called thankfulness. In that same dependent humility, we look ahead to the future and what God has promised, and we see our total dependence on God, and that's called faith. That's mine. Christianity is humility. Jesus moves the conversation along, and now he 
kind of starts to cut to the chase. He says, if you knew who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So he takes what they have in common, the need for water. And he, he steers this conversation in a spiritual direction. And now the woman's curiosity is piqued. You know, like, what are you talking about? And Jesus doesn't look like much. He just looks like a strange, frail man who doesn't have anything to offer. And obviously he's not talking about anything that comes out of this well because he doesn't even have a pail. So what are you talking about? What are you trying to say? Are you saying that your water is better? This is what she's used to. This is the way she's used to people treating her. Are you saying that your water is better than the water from this well that has served me and my people for so long, all, almost 2,000 years, all the way back to, to the time of Jacob? Right? Israel himself, is that what you're saying? Your water is better? Well, yes, yes, that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water, this water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So a moment ago, he's begging for simple water. Now, he's offering the greatest gift ever. The living water of his gospel that quenches the thirsty soul forever. And that water, if that is in you, then that just builds, just grows, just wells up until so it overflows and flows out as truth and love. And if you live off the word of Christ, like you need it, like you crave it, like it's all that you need, like you, you want it, need it, crave it, like it's water, like it's your basic life source, well, then you will never need to thirst or desire for anything else ever again because you will always have all that you need. It will never run dry. But that's easier said than done. And Jesus' offer is lost on this woman, at least at first. It doesn't soak in. Her response is not rejoicing, and maybe you can understand why. She is so bogged down. Her heart and her mind are so bogged down by the, the weight and the stresses of, of the challenges of life. Jesus, this, this concept that you're trying to share with me, you make it sound so easy and you say it's for my good, but it just doesn't fit with everything else that I already have on my plate and on my shoulders and on my mind. So I don't have room for it. I don't have time for it. I don't have the energy for it. I thought you understood my need. The woman said, Give me this water so I won't have to keep coming here. You really want to help me? Make my life easier. Disease comes. Bills pile up. Work gets harder. Family strife increases. And, and through it all, we, can, we convince ourselves that if, God, if Jesus really wants to help us, then he's going to just make all of these things go away. No. Because that's addressing the symptoms. Jesus has given us the help that we need by making our sin go away. Sin is the problem. So let's talk about sin. Let's notice that when Jesus does, when Jesus talks about sin, he does it with truth and love. This woman has just told him that the best thing he could do for her is unburden her. But instead, Jesus is going to show her that she's carrying around a burden far heavier than any jug of water. And here's where we need to stop and think fairly practically about this story. A story that I think you've probably heard before. And so you probably come in with some thoughts about what this story is about. And that's, that's good. That's fine. But I have a Greek lesson for you today. Nothing too complex. We're just going to talk about one word. The Greek word aner. It means man. But if the context fits better, you could also use a secondary translation of human being. Or, if the context fits best, you could also translate it a third way, which is husband. And this is the word that shows up in verses what, 16 to 18, like six times. 
Now, I, I don't really care which way you translate it. If you translate it as man or if you translate it as husband, I think it, it can go either way. And I don't think it really matters. But what does matter, I think, is that once you choose a translation, you stick with it. You stay consistent. And you translate that word the same way every time it comes up. And I've never seen a translation that does that. But if we did, it would sound something like this. Go get your man and come back. I don't have a man. You're right that you don't have a man. In fact, you have had five men. And the man you now have is not your man. What you have just said is quite true. And I think that helps these words be a little bit more clearer and maybe take on a slightly different meaning than you've ever realized they had before. Um, I, I, this woman has not had five weddings and five divorces. I mean, that's ridiculous even today. No, this woman has had sex with five different men. And maybe that's something that 21st century Americans don't bat an eye at, instead more likely to give a thumbs up to. But we should bat an eye. We should be ashamed and discouraged and disgusted. And first century Jews certainly were. This woman has no friend. She's alone at the well because she's a social outcast. All the other women from town get together first thing in the morning and they go together with each other to draw the water for the day. Here she is by herself at noon because she's not welcome <coughs> to join the rest of them. At noon in the heat of the day, she's out there by herself outside of town where Samaritans often find one who has fallen into the hands of robbers. Does that sound like a good idea for a woman to be going, doing by herself, unprotected in the middle of the day? No. That's the way it is. That is a burden that she bears. And now, now there's Jesus telling her what her conscience already tells her, what her community already tells her. And he makes that burden even worse, as he tells her, woman, you are a floozy. Your life is a mess. And it, don't tell me that it's because you have to go and fetch the water. The all-knowing Son of God is completely aware of what's going on in her life, just as he is of our lives. The sinful woman is living in a sinful situation and it has made her an outcast from her community, but more to the point, it has separated her from God. Because that's what sin does. Always. And in that separation, the burden of our guilt just gets heavier and heavier no matter how hard you try. We cannot deny that sin's wage of death is busy demanding payment all around us. We understand that one day, our bill will come due. Jesus, Jesus tells her, I don't want to cause offense by talking to you without your husband here. Why don't, why don't you go get him and then come back and we'll continue the conversation. She thinks to herself, that's not an issue. He's not my husband. I mean, sure, he's this water. I mean, I'm going to take it to his house for him. He's going to use it. He's going to use me, but he's never protected me. He doesn't really care about me. So don't let it stop you. Don't worry about it. I don't have a husband. You don't have a husband. In fact, you have had five husbands. But the husband you have now is not your husband. Boom. Well, I can see that you're a prophet. Right? And then the next thing that she says is our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, that might seem like a diversion. 
right? Like she's just trying to dismiss this and, and, and move on to another subject, but I don't think so. I don't think that someone, I, I, someone who tries to change the subject from this topic would, in a few minutes, end up sharing this topic with a town full of people who look down on her. So I, I don't think it's a diversion. I think she's expressing desire, desire that she doesn't really know how to express. Um, you're a prophet, so you would know. You can help me. You, you might have the answer. Can you tell me? This is my desire. Have I just been doing it wrong? Everything? I, I've tried. But Samaritans say one thing and you Jews teach another thing and I feel like I don't even know what to believe anymore. You're right. I am a disgusting sinner. I know that. But I've tried. What am I supposed to do? Is there any hope for someone like me? At this point, if we're in this conversation, I think at this point, this is when it gets pretty easy for us to let this spiritual conversation digress into nothing more than a, than, than a religious debate. But religious debates... Right? And maybe, maybe that's what you and I would usually do if we had this opportunity. But, but religious debates about what people do and how we're supposed to live our lives really do no good. It's just law. Uh, they, they serve no purpose. Motivated by arrogance, they serve no purpose. It's certainly not our Savior's purpose. Look at the love and patience that he has with this woman as he says, believe me. It has always been God's plan to bring a savior into this world through the Jewish nation. And that savior has now come. Do you worship God because he promises you a savior? And you thank and praise him for it? Or do you worship God because you want him to make your life easier in return? That's, hope, that's what you're hoping to get out of. It's not about where you worship. It's about how you worship. The location of your worship is not what matters. It can't because your worship is supposed to be a constant, continual act of worship wherever you are and whatever you're doing. But the attitude of your heart is what matters. A time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. When Jesus talks about the water of the well, and he talks about the living water, the word that he uses for the water in the well is a word that means stagnant. And the word he uses when he talks about the gospel is a word that means flowing. So when you think about your faith, think about how you worship. Think about your response to the love of your Savior in your life. As you think about it, does it look like something that's apathetic and complacent and stagnant? Like a well just sitting there in case somebody happens to walk by and tries to pull something out of it? Or is your Christian life more like a river that never stops flowing, that never stops desiring to praise God? The woman says, I know someday the promised Savior is going to come and he will have all the answers. Right? He will answer all our questions. But I'm asking you, and I'm asking you now, is there any hope for someone like me? Can God love someone like me? Will God forgive someone like me? And Jesus says, I am that Savior. And I have come to answer those questions. And the answer is yes. This living water, this, this hope, does not at all depend on anything that you do. Just drink it up. Believe it. And then she gets it. Now she sees that this is not just some man who's going to pile on the guilt. This is her savior. And he proclaims forgiveness. And he does it by relating with her, right? starting a conversation based on what they have in common, showing that he cares about her, 
and he tells her the truth. It's not that hard. And the next thing we know is that she has left her jug at the well and she goes back into that town full of people who don't even like her and what flows out of her is truth and love. And what, what a great example she, she gives us. You, you don't have to be Jesus sitting at the well miraculously knowing who's coming and what they need. You don't even have to be a, a, a long-time Christian to share the gospel. All you have to do is say what you know. Just tell them of what he has done for you and, and invite them. Like she invites the townspeople. Come, see. Right? Come, see for yourself. And if you read ahead, verse 39 tells us, Many believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I think that a story like this is important for you and I to keep in mind when we speak to people about Jesus. We know their great need because they are like us, sinners. We've been there. We can relate. We know it's sufferings, the hurts and heartache caused by sin, our sin, and the sins of those around us. We can speak about sin and guilt, and when we do, we can do so with truth and love. With compassion and understanding, we speak about sin and guilt, and we speak about the one who has taken that burden upon himself. You can't tell your friends that Jesus is going to cover the cost of health care or their child's education, but you can tell them about the much greater debt that Jesus has completely taken away, that Jesus has completely canceled with his lifeblood as the price. So what just happened? What did Jesus tell this woman and then what did she go telling everyone else? What is that Jesus, that, that Jesus wants us to know? What is it that Jesus wants us to others? What is it that's going to make us really worship? Not the law. Not because you think you're supposed to. The gist of what, what this story is about, the gist of what, what Jesus wants you to know and, and, and to live knowing, it sounds something like this. Dear friends in Christ, you cannot be more loved or more forgiven than you are right now. Amen. And may that love of God, which surpasses ours and our understanding, continue to guard and keep your hearts and minds in faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.